Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to SMG Viewers Comments, episode number 172. This is my weekly show where I try and answer your comments and questions to the best of my ability. Hope you're gonna have a wonderful weekend. Let's get right to it. As a 17 year old, what are some ways to get to where you are as an audio engineer for a career? All right, I think the best way to answer your question would be, okay, what would I say to 17 year old me? Rule number one would be prepared to work your ass off for a very, very, very long time uh, for not a whole lot of reward. You're gonna work with a lot of bands who are gonna go out of their way to fuck up their own records through either lack of practice, bad attitudes, bad instruments, just all around bad shit and look at you like it's your job to fix their crap and then turn them into the next Metallica. You're going to be doing that for a very long time before you get any kind of recognition whatsoever. Um, and the thing is, a lot of critics of this show will say, well, well, well what's he done? And well, aside from a couple of black metal records that did pretty well and getting to mix a Queensryche song, nothing major. But that's also the thing is you don't necessarily have to do a lot of big acts to have a career. You can work with smaller bands. You can work with the local bands and help them develop their sounds and that kind of thing. And you know, that's what makes me not very different from about 99% of you guys out there watching the show is because I'm a guy working out of his garage who's just been doing it for a very long time and never gave up. So yeah, hard work and perseverance are gonna be the first thing. Um, secondly, read everything you can get your hands on about the subject of recording. Um, that would be the best advice I can get. And if you wanna get started recording bands, just go to local shows and say, hey, can I record you guys? And start out with recording for free. And uh, if you're any good, hopefully word will get out about you and other bands will start talking about you and the phone will start ringing. That's how it worked for me anyway. Good luck, dude. Glenn, I love the show. I apologize if this question has been asked before. Are there any magazines or books you would recommend for an absolute beginner? Yeah, there's tons of stuff. Uh, when I was starting out, I read Recording Magazine for years and years and years, and I read Mix and EQ, uh, found out all kinds of great stuff. These days, everything's kind of moved on to digital format, so hopefully you can go find some old PDFs of those magazines. There's some brilliant interviews in there. I, me I remember the uh, EQ especially did this really cool one with uh, Jeff Emmerich that I really enjoyed. Here's the thing, for myself personally, I wound up with this giant stack of magazines and I wound up giving them away a couple years ago to another local engineer. I'm just like, okay, these are taking up space. I've read all, everything there is to know about them and I really don't have another reason to go through these. So, yeah, okay, who wants them? There's a load of information. Um, you know, whoever, first come, first serve. So a good buddy of mine uh, named Nathan Boots came and got him and I hope he's enjoying the hell out of those mags. Anyway, um, books to read. Some of the Bobby Ozinski stuff can be pretty good. The Mix Engineer's Handbook is pretty good. I used that for reference quite a bit when I was starting out. Another great resource would be to check out the Andy Sneap forum. There are a ton of amazing posts from back in the mid 2000s. Um, and you're gonna find a lot of guys who are doing really well in the music business these days. We're sharing ideas back then. That was uh, Joey Sturgis and Ola England and um, Lassa Lammert and uh, Brett, um, who's from Kalissa, um, a couple of the Ailstorm guys are in there, a couple of the Periphery guys were in there, myself. You know, there, there, there's a whole motley crew of metalheads in there, and we all, we're all trading information on how to make better metal records. So uh, yeah, comb through some of the bigger threads on the Andy Sneap forum. I think you guys will find some really cool stuff in there. Um, that being said, for the drum stuff, check out my free ebook in the description below, and uh, that's called Acoustic Drums for Metal, and it's based around my post I did on the Andy Sneap forum back in the day, and it's in a free ebook format. Everything is condensed down and kind of updated for more modern times. Hope that's helpful, man. Man, so many people being upset is proof that you are doing it right. Besides, it is also hilarious to watch. I am also wondering why they keep throwing insults around instead of bringing up a reason why their beloved gear is so good. Shouldn't be that difficult to find one if it actually wasn't a piece of shit. I believe you're referencing my Marshall Code review, and yeah, you gotta love those arguments. Oh, well, your, your review's wrong because you're an idiot. Gotta love the ad hominem arguments. You're not finding, you won't find too many arguments to explain why the Marshall has good tone. Um, I'm sorry, that amp's just fucking terrible, and Marshall should fucking know better than to try and sell that. I understand they're trying to get a piece of that Line 6 spider market. There's a lot of money to be, to, to be made selling beginner amps to people who don't know any better, but those people out there who watch this show and are smart and are informed know that they don't have to spend a lot of money to get a great sound. Um, take a look at the Joyo Zombie, for example. You guys have heard me talk about that numerous times. It's a fantastic amp that's competitively priced that does one thing and does it well instead of 500 things really bad. 
Whitey Piashes. Wrecked a 200 buck amp. Whoopity do. Think of what movies and stuff damage. Self righteous blowhards. Keep the videos coming. Again, referencing the Marshall Code review. Oh, you should have donated that amp. Why'd you have to break it? Why'd you have to break I love those fucking comments. It's like, have you guys not watched the fucking hydraulic press channel? The guy's got 2 million subscribers. What's he do? He breaks shit to my hydraulic press. Um, hey, let me know if you guys want to see a collab. I think that'd be cool. Maybe we could put like a Marshall Code or Alliance Six Spider into a hydraulic press. Maybe I could shoot that around here. Would you guys like to see that? That might be fun. Hey guys, just gonna break in here for a sec. A bunch of you guys were asking for a banana dine shirt based on the completely realistic automatic pitch video. If you haven't watched that, check that out. Anyway, I'm gonna make that available and I've also got a special shirt on sale for this week only. It is Pitch Correction, making music suck since 1998. Like I said, it's gonna be around for just one week only. So if you wanna get it, get it now. Now back to the show. Yes, I don't know how often you deal with this shit, but I recently had a drummer come in with a broken bottom head on a snare, and he swore it made him sound better. That drummer's now $100 short and no longer has a snare drum. Okay, I'm not sure I quite got the ending part of that statement. Um, have I had drummers come in with broken heads and say it sounds better? Um, no, I used to rehearse with a drummer who had his heads uh, taped together with duct tape because he was too cheap, and then he bought new heads, and I'm like, look, dude, we're going in the studio in a few weeks. Don't put them on until just before you go in. So what's he do? He puts the heads on immediately. <sighs> fucking drummers, you just can't reason with them. Uh, half the reason I got a very good studio kit was for exactly that sort of thing, so I won't have to deal with broken cymbals or broken drum heads or any of that crap. If you're running a home studio, I highly recommend investing in a good drum set. Um, I bought mine back in 2001, and here we are 17 years later. Um, you guys will tell me if I got that math wrong. Um, some 17 years later, and uh, still have that same kit, and it still sounds magnificent and it was a definitely a good investment that paid for itself. So don't trust the drummer, trust yourself. Okay, I am very dim. What is an impulse response and what does it do? My first guess is purchasing chocolate, but I doubt it's that. Okay, an impulse response is basically a digital snapshot of a guitar amp cab. The speakers, you know, what the sound is actually coming out of. Um, what happens is a sine wave is run through that, so it captures the sound of that particular mic and speaker combination um, and captures you know how it responds at various parts in the overall frequency sweep spectrum say like from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and then it convolves it down to this little pulse and that's your impulse response so basically you can load up all these different impulses of different cabinets and you can get their sound and that's what lancaster audio does we've got my sounds we got warren's and then we've got some from our friends like ulrich wild who did all the death clock stuff we got brendan small's marshall cab we use the exact same mics that were used on all the death clock stuff and the preamps and all that kind of stuff so you can literally plug your amp in and go through like say a torpedo captor or something like that and get that sound so that's pretty damn cool or you can use a straight up amp sim like the fort nameless which as far as amp sims go as far as software amp sims go wow is that ever good hopefully that cleared things up man best spent 50 dollars of my life i was using two notes wall of sound irs and spent hours to make it sound like something half good with my chapman seven string and angle e 530 preamp ending up with a muddy presence lacking tone even with all the high mids and trouble with glenn's ir pack and the pulse plugin i popped two irs chose that random and boom instantly got the sound i wanted all along keep rocking glenn well, if that isn't an endorsement of my IR pack, uh, I don't know what is. You can check it out at LancasterAudio.com. Of course, I'll have a link in the description below. Uh, once again, we've got some really cool stuff, um, including Lemmy's Cab and um, a lot of the stuff from Cameron Webb's place. So if you like that whole uh, so-called punk sound as well, you can get your hands on that. Pretty damn cool. Hopefully we've got some more uh, demo videos in the process. Anyway, yeah, LancasterAudio.com. It's something I've been working on with Warren Hewitt for the last uh, a little while and it's uh, turning out pretty cool. If you guys don't know what the hell I'm talking about, I'll link to that video as well, where I show off what my custom impulses are all about. Long story alert, long story alert. This actually happened. I was crewing for a friend's band at a large packed venue. During their backstage warm up, the guitarist broke a string and he quickly replaced it without cutting off the excess of the machine head end. So he had nine inches long and then a bit of a B string hanging off. So the gig starts with an intro tape, all atmospheric, heats of anticipation. The drummer cants in, the flash pots go off, and the lights go up, and the guitarist did an action stance down on one knee and bent his body over his effects pedals. Somehow, at probably something like a million to one chance, the string went into the tiny slot of the pedal board's six plug power supplies only to the empty socket, and the whole place went BANG! 
He was thrown across the stage, all the power went down, the venue went black, and all of his strings were torn off the guitar. A moment later of utter silence, and then the place erupted into a massive, explosive brawl in the dark, smashing bottles and screaming people everywhere. End of the gig, closed venue, and a single solitary note played. It was fucking awesome. Oh, isn't rock and roll fun? You know, I, I can tell you a story about when my band played uh, a gig uh, at a, um, a veterans hall once, and... Um yeah, a bunch of skinheads started a brawl, and we got out of there early before shit hit the fan. Like, we knew it was a bad scene. We knew things were going badly that night, and we just looked at each other. Okay, yeah, let's pack the shit up. Let's get the fuck out of here. And uh, for whatever reason, I think we had a couple different cars, and they got separated. And one, a couple of guys decided to go back to the gig for whatever reason, and uh, they sh were driving by and didn't slow down because it had... Uh, spilled out into the front lawn of this place and there were just people and bodies everywhere and just it was a pretty violent horrible night so I'm glad we left when we did so yeah uh, keep your eyes out for that because shit can hit the fan when you least expect it here's a good one too and I was just reading this in KK Downing's book the other day um, if you ever watched that Judas Priest Fuel for Life uh, live DVD it would have been VHS back in the day uh, the 86 Turbo Tour and um, they did this beautiful concert uh, film, you know, shot on film. It looked like it was in Panavision. I think it was just gorgeous. But uh, K.K. Downing's wearing sunglasses the whole night, and you'd never see the guy wear sunglasses in his entire career of, like, you know, 40 years playing with Judas Priest. And what had happened was um, he had a guitar string break. He had a tech fix it and put it back in, and what actually happened was he clipped it, didn't clip it short enough, and he was playing and Rob Halford bumped him somehow and the end of the stick string wound up going into his eye. Yeah, left obviously a horrible mark and whatnot. He wasn't blinded, he got to keep the eye. That's nice, nice to know. But it just, you know, horribly bloodied and all that kind of stuff. So when they actually shot the concert video, there was no way he could go on stage like that. So hence the glasses. So if you watch that, it's actually, he said he was in screaming agony the whole time. So it's very painful for him to watch that. So <gasps> clip your strings, kids, it does pay off. Hi Glenn, when I was a child, I was told I had dyspraxia and it has affected my guitar playing. I've been playing for years and I've worked hard to get where I am now. There are days when I do well and days when I feel held back. I'm about to join a band which will most likely go to play live and I fear there will be a show where I can't play. Do you have any advice on how I can make sure I can play my best every live show? I appreciate any feedback and I love the show. Fuck you from the UK. Hey Alex, thanks so much for writing. Now, any advice I can give here, please take with a grain of salt because bear in mind, I'm just a studio guy with a love for recording and that's where my knowledge is. I am not a qualified medical professional. The best advice I can give to you because honestly, I'm not sure exactly what dyspraxia is. I'm just reading what, making sure I got the name right there. I'm not exactly sure what the deal is there. I haven't had a chance to look it up. The best advice I can give is remember when you go on stage, you're playing a character. And if you have good days and bad days, the best thing you can do is teach yourself a routine for gigging. And that has everything from pulling your guitar out of its case to getting yourself in the right mental state to go on stage. Don't fake yourself out. Just get up there and do the absolute best you can. Um, but routine is probably the best way for somebody in your situation. Seriously, dude, if you are worried about that, I would try talking to a doctor and see what he recommends. But um, seriously, thanks so much for writing and I wish you the absolute best of luck and I wish you the greatest success, man. Guys like you are what inspire me. I mean, like working with a disability and still playing music, I think that's fucking amazing. And I wish more people had your go-getter attitude because we'd probably all be making a lot better records. So Glenn, do you think the Joyo would be suitable for playing shows at smaller and medium-sized venues? And also, do you think you could review on the Micro Dark as well in the near future? Hey Mike, great question. Um, I can answer that actually uh, with a resounding yes. Here's a great point. Uh, Brandon Wright, who you've seen on the show numerous times, he actually did a show at a medium-sized club with the Joyo Zombie, and it was hilarious, you know, because he rolls up with a Marshall 4x12 and this tiny little zombie. And you know, the sound guy just laughed at him. He's like, ha, 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 until he turned it on and fired it up and it just roared to life. And, and then he was like, oh, wow, that's actually really cool. Um, it's only 20 watts, but you know, 20 watts or a four by 12 can be pretty freaking loud. Um, it's, you know, gotta remember you're playing medium, medium sized venues. Chances are you're gonna have a mic'd cabinet. So you only have to worry about hearing yourself on stage. And the PA is gonna do the rest of the job. So um, yeah, you don't definitely don't need the whole Ingve setup, you know, with like 80 million plexis all cranked to a million and you know, they can hear you, you know, seven states over. 
So yeah, yeah, the Joyo Zombie awesome, that is an absolutely awesome option. Just make sure you get a cabinet for it. The Zombie with the 2x12 Harley Benton is going to be plenty loud to keep up with any drummer on stage. No problem whatsoever. I'm willing to bet if this were 1989 and they heard Dime Dag Daryl's super artificial nasty Pantera guitar sound, they'd be ranting about how bad it sounds as well. Nothing is bad if you use it correctly, especially if you don't try to make it something that's not. It's a $250 digital lamp. What do you want? If you're pairing it with a $200,000 worth of studio gear and you expect it to sound like a $2,000 tube amp, of course it will fall short. But then I'd ask, what the fuck are you doing with a $250 practice amp in a recording studio? Anyway, besides, as much as I also hate the Line 6 Spider and the Line 6 Pod 2.0 has been used on one gold record by a now famous rock band, I saw it in the producer's studio and confirmed that it supplied all the sound on the band's record. Okay, first and foremost, I remember when Pantera hit the, hit the scene. I remember when the Cowboys from Hell video premiered and I remember that guitar tone and I'm like, wow, that's really different. That's really cool. The big thing about this and you've missed the point with the code and the spider is they are pretending to be something they're not. They're branding themselves as, oh, you can get this sound of this amp through this crappy little piece of shit. There's actually a, a Plexi preset and guess what? The code sounds nothing like a Plexi. Sorry, it's just not happening. Kind of like how the, you know, they've got all the different models in the spider and say, oh, well, this sounds like this amp and this sounds like this amp. No, they don't. They never have. That's the problem I have with this amp. They are selling themselves as something they're not. And as for the argument, oh, you shouldn't be bringing those amps into the studio. Well, you know what? I was just had a chat with another local engineer the other day and guess what argument he had? He had an argument with the guitar player trying to bring a spider into the studio. I've had this argument, I don't know how many times. Somebody brought in a spider head. We've got a freaking dual rectifier sitting next to it and the guy wants to use a spider head. This, this is the bullshit you're gonna have to deal with when you try and make records. I paid money for it, therefore I'm using it. Logic be, that's the logic you're dealing with. Doesn't make any fucking sense, but if they paid for it, they're gonna use it on their fucking record and they don't care because they know better even though you've been making records for 20 years. Ugh. Imagine going to prison for threatening someone on YouTube about a Line 6 Spider review. Well, I don't think anybody would go to prison. They might get probation or a fine or something like that, unless they've had numerous offenses beforehand. Then they might wind up in prison. I mean, like, we, we you know, threatening people is illegal in Canada, but we are quite sane about it. A buddy of mine, he went to jail for a night for threatening somebody, and then, you know, he had to go to court after, and that made his life very difficult for a period of time. So the general idea is behave yourself. If you don't like my review, great. Offer a counter argument. Don't threaten me because of it. Someone shoot this guy! And here I thought we were going to be reasonable. Guess that was too much to hope for. HP42. Hey, there's actually some useful information in here. I just might subscribe to this channel. I recommend your channel all the time, especially to people suffering from a lack of sleep. Are you suffering from insomnia? I highly recommend HP42 Studios. Have you ever had your hair stuck in a guitar bridge? Uh, tuning pegs, yes, not the bridge, but definitely tuning pegs. Car doors stepped on by the guitar player, caught in the lights at a gig. Um, yeah, you name it, I pretty much got my hair caught in. For some, for some reason, I've still managed to work at a factory for 25 years and haven't had it ripped out by a, you know, an air, air uh, gun or a drill or anything like that. So I'm very, very thankful for that. But yes, it's been caught in a lot of things. Everyone always overcomplicates this. Sex outsells any other emotional interest. Your hate, anger, fear, pride, love, and your rock music is surpassed by pop music sex. End of story. Rock and roll used to have sex in it, but that started to end in the late 80s. Rock in the 90s and later was mostly fueled by the aforementioned idea. Rock and roll has lost its sex appeal, and so it's over. You know what? I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. You know, rock and roll used to be dangerous and it did used to be sexy, but we're not allowed to do that anymore because, you know, the minute you start doing something even remotely sexy, you get all kinds of left wing nut jobs protesting. Oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Shut the fuck up. You know, rock and roll used to be fun and that sexy. Well, what's wrong with being sexy? Um, I know that's not going to happen on this show ever anytime but you know um yeah i think rock and roll does need to have a sex appeal brought back and like i said i think that that comment there made a lot of sense so hey you guys out there who want to stand out from the crowd better get your image together because it's something sorely lacking these days all right that's it for this episode before i go i just want to say thank you so much for watching if you could do me a favor hit the like button share this with your friends and please hit the subscribe button it would go a long way into helping me out if you want to learn more about recording, check out one of my tutorials. And if you want to check out some really hilarious gear reviews, check out Fearless Gear Reviews. Once again, I've got the Pitch Correction shirt available this week and this week only. Till next time, I'm out of here.